Okay. All right. Well, if anybody joins, I created a new stream. Unfortunately, it's a different link than the original. Um, really apologize to anybody who's watching that original stream, but uh, we're going to try this one more time. Okay. So today I'm talking about awe, and I just want to start out with this quote from Albert Einstein, uh, where he says, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and all science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. So that I think brings in, um, so I was saying, if you're watching this, I apologize for the repeat, but uh, that uh, awe and, and, and science have this relationship with each other. And that's really what I want to talk about today is um, the science of awe and the brain, the neuroscience, um, and how awe can be a key to, to health and happiness and understanding the universe. And um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about uh, where we're going in this discussion. Again, going to talk about the definition of awe, some of the psychology and neuroscience research around awe. Um, and then uh, just ask that uh, if you feel so inclined to uh, give some support during this chat, a, a super chat, um, or go to patreon.com slash sense of mind, and there's some ways to support the channel. Really do need your uh, direct support to keep this channel going. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's just get right into it. Um, yeah, so once again, beauty is a catalyst for awe. So throughout, I just want to kind of um, ground this discussion in the idea that savoring whatever beauty that's available to you, whether you're looking out from like a mountain peak or, a, or looking at the, the vast ocean around you or hearing beautiful music, um, that these can all be experiences uh, that can elicit awe, that can bring that, that type of wonder and beauty into your mind. Um, so that's going to be a theme that beauty, especially in the natural world, but also in great artistic works and even in meaningful social connections can be a catalyst for experiencing awe. And um, to, to get a little bit uh, deeper into what I'm talking about here, uh, I just want to quote the psychologist Dacher Keltner, who has studied awe for, for decades and has a recent book that you can find in the, the link in the description of this video. He writes that, quote, Awe is the emotion we experience when we experience vast mysteries that we don't understand. So vast mysteries that we don't understand. And he talks about a number of benefits that, that come along with awe and how having more awe in your life seems to make us happier, less anxious, less depressed, better able to cope with grief, healthier, more connected to others in a positive way, and less narcissistic. And so for those reasons alone, it seems like an emotion worth cultivating. And, and so that, but, but there's also this, this uh, piece of it that seems to have to do with understanding reality and kind of expanding our understanding of reality. And uh, this relates to a discussion of um, awe and science. And we'll get into one of the studies that showed that there is really this relationship between understanding science and the emotion of awe. Um, and I want to uh, ground that with this quote from Richard Dawkins. Uh, he wrote this book, Unweaving the Rainbow. And in it, he writes, quote, the feeling of awed wonder that science can give us is one of the highest experiences of which the human psyche is capable. It is a deep aesthetic passion to rank with the finest that music and poetry can deliver. It is truly one of the things that makes life worth living, and it does so, if anything, more effectively if it convinces us that the time we have for living is quite finite. So that, um, I think, is just a really eloquent expression of how, how understanding science can bring out that experience of awe as well. And um, going back to Dacher Keltner, uh, he had this 2018 study, uh, which, which really hit directly on this point. And it showed that people who are naturally more likely to experience awe rather than those who are kind of uh, experimentally induced to feel awe or you know, might experience it in the moment, but 
have a low natural tendency to experience it. So the people with high, what's called dispositional awe, tend to have a, quote, more accurate understanding of how science works, rejection of creationism, and rejection of unwarranted teleological explanations more broadly. Um, but the question that kind of arises with that is whether awe, whether the emotion of awe actually helps us develop this more accurate understanding, or if it's just a byproduct of people who are sort of scientifically minded. Um, and so that, as of that 2018 study, was not really understood. Uh, but Keltner and colleagues, the authors, speculated that it might be a reciprocal relationship where greater scientific understanding and more frequent awe experiences mutually reinforce each other. So they, they titled the paper, uh, Awe as a Scientific Emotion. So kind of a play on words there. Um, and uh, so this kind of brings us to getting into the neuroscience. And to, to really understand that, I think it's good to have a more fleshed out definition of what we mean by awe. And um, there is this recent article published uh, or by the authors Takano and Nomura, and you can find that in the references. Um, but they give this definition of awe that kind of, uh, again, makes this connection to, to understanding, to changing our understanding of the world. And they write that, quote, awe consists of two features, a perception of vastness, which is the sense that one has encountered something immense in size, social status, or complexity, and the need for accommodation which is the process by which a person revises one's mental schemas or creates a new one to account for the deviation between the stimuli and one's current understanding of the world. So that, I think, really sets the stage for how awe works in the human brain. So um, let's get into that with the, the first study that... Uh, that hit on kind of the neuroscience of awe that we're going to talk about. Um, and this had to do with looking at the correlation between brain structure and dispositional awe. So again, that idea of people who naturally experience awe more readily than others and uh, various structures in the brain and how those are correlated. And the first one is, uh, well, the study was published by Fang Guan and colleagues, and you can find that in the description again. Um, and what they found was that basically three regions, the anterior cingulate cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex, which are kind of uh, one contiguous structure that are not really visible from the outside of the brain, but they're part of the cortex and they're sort of under the, uh, the frontal and um, parietal lobes. And a another region called the middle temporal gyrus, which is visible from the outside. It's part of the, the temporal lobe. Don't feel like you have to memorize this neuroanatomy, but the point is that the gray matter volume of these regions, so how many neurons are, are sort of packed into that region, correlate with dispositional awe negatively. So, so in other words, people who answer yes to questions like, I often feel awe, I, I see beauty all around me, I feel wonder almost every day. I have many opportunities to see the beauty of nature. I often look for patterns in objects around me and I seek out experiences that challenge my understanding. If you answer yes to those questions, you're more likely to have lower gray matter volume in your ACC, PCC, and MTG, middle temporal gyrus. So let's talk about what are those regions involved in and how does this help explain kind of the, the experience, the phenomenology of awe. So the ACC, the anterior cingulate cortex, seems to be involved in um, a number of functions, but one of them being detecting errors and resolving cognitive conflicts. So for example, the ACC may activate if you notice evidence that contradicts a belief you hold. Whereas the PCC seems to represent the subjective value of rewards, which sort of makes sense given that awe is, is generally a positive emotion. So you can start to see that the ACC's involvement in detecting errors and resolving cognitive conflicts has some relationship with awe. And then what about the middle temporal gyrus? Well, 
it's involved in detecting incongruities. So for example, the MTG, the middle temporal gyrus, may activate when you hear a joke and understand the punchline, right? which is kind of resolving um, the, uh, the, the setup of a joke. It's sort of that detecting that incongruity and then resolving it. And um, so you can see that this detecting incongruities or detecting errors and resolving cognitive conflicts would have something to do with that, that um, changing of mental schemas that is sort of characteristic of awe. And um, to kind of explain this further, that lower gray matter volume of those regions in people with higher dispositional awe may reflect a greater ease in accommodating new knowledge and mental schemas. So in other words, if you're naturally more likely to experience awe, it may partially be a result of having an easier time in expanding your understanding of the natural and social worlds. So as the authors of that, that study write, um, people with higher dispositional awe may have, quote, an increased propensity to embrace cognitive accommodation and new knowledge, end quote. So that's to say that people who are more likely to frequently experience awe may be more likely to assimilate, assimilate new knowledge into their understanding of the world and to, to kind of expand that, those mental schemas and change them according to new experiences. And so that's kind of the first study was looking at the correlation between the structure of these various regions and the dispositional awe. Um, but to kind of get a more intuitively satisfying uh, correlation, uh, I want to turn from looking at structure and dispositional awe to the activity of the brain and the experience of awe. So this is an interesting study. It's a 2019 study by Michiel van Elk and colleagues. Again, you can find this in the description if you're interested. But um, they found that while watching videos that elicited awe as compared to videos that did not elicit awe, subjects showed a reduced activity in three key areas of the default mode network. And why is that relevant? So the, the default mode network is a collection of brain regions that tend to co-activate most strongly during like self-referential thought. So thinking about ourselves, especially ourselves in social contexts, sort of the story of our lives and, and mind wandering it kind of pops up when people aren't really doing anything in the scanner, the brain scanner. But on the other hand, the DMN tends to be less active during tasks that require outwardly focused attention. So that uh, at first glance makes sense because right, these subjects were instructed to simply watch these awe-inspiring videos to absorb themselves into it. So you would expect that that sort of self-referential thinking, that mind wandering would go down and then this outwardly focused attention would be stronger. But more relevant to the, the experience of awe in particular is that one of the kind of telltale psychological uh, characteristics of awe seems to be a shrinking sense of self. People feel that they're, they're not having that sort of self-referential thought, not thinking about themselves. They're more just really fully absorbed in this experience. And again, that can be partly explained by the relative reduction in the default mode uh, activity, right? Because it's so important for that, so, that sort of thought. But they also found that compared to videos that did not elicit awe, when subjects were watching the, the awe videos, they showed a relative increase in the activity of regions of the frontoparietal network. So this is a different network. It's also called the central executive network. And it's activated during tasks that require like working memory, problem solving, and other high level cognitive functions. So that would also make sense that when you're absorbed into this attention demanding task, you'd show higher activity in this central executive network, lower activity in the DMN. And that relates to the next study, the, uh, the last study that we're going to talk about here, um, which this one explored the brain's response to two types of awe. 
So positive awe on the one hand and threat awe on the other. So it's kind of interesting that there's this distinction between these two different types of awe, because I think most of us just think of it as a, a purely positive emotion. And um, I think that's, you know, probably most of the time what we experience when we're uh, talking about awe, but it refers, the, the difference between these two refers to kind of the different emotional responses we might have to experiences that are vast and impressive and outside of our normal range of a normal frame of reference. So for example, positive awe would be experienced like what we've been talking about, watching these beautiful nature scenes, a breathtaking sunset over the ocean or um, other you know experiences that elicit that wonder and admiration and positivity. Whereas threat awe, on the other hand, might arise while experiencing a powerful thunderstorm, right? If, say you're standing on that mountain peak and these thunder clouds start rolling in and all of a sudden now you're having this sense of fear and danger and it's it's but it's still characterized by that that overwhelming vast impressive powerful um sensation but it's it's more of a, a negative variety it's more like i need to escape this and uh, we'll relate this back to some of the things that we've already talked about. But first, you know, you would just you would expect that if there's these two different types of awe, this positive and threat awe, that there would be a a difference in the uh, the activation of the brain. There'd be different patterns of activation for these different types of awe. And indeed, in a, a 2020 study by Takano and Nomura, which you can find in the description. The left middle temporal gyrus, which you might recognize that we talked about before, which had that lower uh, low, uh, negative correlation with higher dispositional awe, right? this part of the brain that's involved in detecting incongruities and interpreting events, it becomes less active during both types of awe, although there, there is a caveat there. But this does seem to help explain how that, that changing understanding of the world occurs, that it's, it's, this activity is going down in this area that detects incongruities. But I do think it's important to note that one of the differences between positive and negative awe in this specific finding is that while during the positive awe experiences, the MTG, the middle temporal gyrus, uh, the activity went down compared to um, neutral or amusing or fear-inducing videos. So it was it was reduced compared to all the conditions that the researchers looked at. But threat awe, the, the negative sort of awe, only showed reduced middle temporal gyrus activity compared to amusement and fear, but not to neutral videos. So I, th I find that a, an, an intriguing difference, kind of an odd thing to see there, but um, but it makes sense that there would be one of, that would be one of the differences. But kind of more interestingly in the study was what they saw in terms of the communication between brain regions rather than just the uh, the activity of of one individual region. So in positive awe, there's more communication between that middle temporal gyrus and regions we mentioned before, like the ACC and PCC. So the ACC being involved in, in uh, detecting cognitive conflicts, resolving those conflicts, and the PCC being involved in coding for subjective, uh, the subjective value of reward. And so having more communication between these regions may help to explain uh, the, the uh, how we, we make sense of these new experiences and have this, this positive experience that goes along with positive awe. And contrasting that in, in threat awe, the left MTG, the middle temporal gyrus, communicates more with the amygdala. And the amygdala, of course, is part of the fight or flight response. It's part of our fear, our experience of fear or arousal. And so it, it would make sense that we need these kind of reactions to, to the danger, to, to whatever this vast and powerful and dangerous thing that's eliciting this kind of threat awe. Um, there would be more communication between uh, this region, the middle temporal gyrus and the amygdala. 
And again, these are these are still just correlational studies, and and this area of neuroscience is young. Um, but I think it, it's really interesting. And we're starting to see this picture of this this really powerful, um, desirable emotion coming. Uh, into a picture of, of how we can understand it at the level of neuroscience. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're at this point getting anything out of this video, please give it a, a like and a subscribe. And um, now I'm going to kind of transition from the science into relating it to our personal experiences and starting out with, with this distinction between positive awe and threat awe. I think one one interesting part of that is that I feel like many of us could could agree that some of the most powerful awe experiences contain mostly positive awe with a bit of 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 that fear or threat awe mixed in. So um, I, I just have a memory of of this kind of thing when I was uh, in high school when I was a teenager. I I grew up in um, Boulder, Colorado, and uh, my friends and I we would spend hours not only hiking the trails, but driving way too fast, probably up and down these, these winding mountain roads, uh, just soaking in the, the epic beauty of the Rockies combined with this, this, you know, speed, uh, of, of going down the mountains and up. And, and I think that mixture of the incredible beauty along with the kind of the fear, the danger induced by the possibility of like driving off a cliff, uh, was, both reflective of the distinction between positive and threat awe, but also I believe it's like there's this more, even more powerful experience that can come along uh, when we have them happening in concert. But that's just, uh, just a little personal aside. And um, I want to kind of get, we've been talking about how nature, there's these natural sources of awe that are really common. These are commonly the most often looked at in, in studies of awe. Um, but there's also uh, human-made sources of awe. So I know that like when you visit beautiful cities like, uh, you know, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, uh, th there are these, there are many potentials uh, for experiencing awe. And some of them are natural, like the the canals that, that go through Amsterdam or the, the oceans uh, that, that run up against many other cities. But others, uh, are social and architectural and cultural. So if you watch those videos of like New York City where people are, pedestrians are flooding the streets and, and just having this, this self-organized nature and this amazing spontaneous cooperation that arises among people and you see that from above or, or you just see it happening in front of you, it can be a sort of uh, kind of odd, uh, inspiring experience. But Many of us, I think, also experience it when we see historical buildings, when we, we can kind of see that vast, the vastness of time that extends, and, and we're part of that, right? Looking at, you know, if you're in Washington, D.C. on the National Mall, or you're in a, a European city and seeing buildings that have been there for, for hundreds of years, and um, or, or you're in a, a more modern city and looking at the, the high rises, the, the skyscrapers that just tower over you, like almost like you're in a forest. Um, that's another kind of awe inspiring experience that is not, you know, not a natural source of awe or not from the natural world. Um, and then, and then there's this kind of everyday awe. This is something that Dacher Keltner talks about in his book that, you know, we can get this from, from just seeing the beautiful murals in public spaces in cities or, or the uh, museums that have amazing artwork or, or objects from, from the deep past that we can look at and see, wow, that, that was there thousands of years ago or, or something painted by Leonardo da Vinci or someone else. And, and even daily performances of, of music or theater, you know, it, it, these are ways that we can experience awe. And, and there's actually this this study by the neuroscientist Bo Lotto, uh, which I don't believe has been published yet, but it's uh, he looked at uh, brain activity while people were watching a Cirque du Soleil performance, and it had this uh, this relationship we talked about earlier, where the activity of the DMN went down. But I just found that interesting that we can you know use nature, but also this uh, amazing performance, uh, the Cirque du Soleil. Uh, to get this this same emotion, it seems like humans just we just can't get enough of it, and um, and I think that 
to get, how do we get more of it? How do we enhance the awe that we already experience in our lives? And um, this kind of brings me to the uh, the tool strategy for, for doing that. And um, this one is called uh, Awe Walks. Awe Walks. <laughs> um, kind of a tongue twister, but um, this is an evidence-based way of getting more awe in your life or enhancing you know, everyday experiences to, to get a little bit of that everyday awe. And um, the way to do this is, uh, one way to do this is to simply go outside into a place of beauty, something that you find beautiful. It could just be a park or a nature preserve, or, you know, if it's in a city, as some of the things I was just talking about, whatever you might find beautiful and, and inspiring. And then walking mindfully through that place. Opening your senses to what's around you, you know, seeing maybe how the sunlight trickles in through the canopy of leaves above you if you're in a park or forest or watching a, a flowing stream and, and smelling the flowers, feeling the grass, just like gazing up, gazing at the stars or the clouds and, and really opening your senses to what's happening. And then opening your mind, right? So to thinking about the vastness, the mystery of nature, the infinity of the sky or the ecosystems, the soil beneath you, or the starlight coming from galaxies, you know, light years away, but illuminating the blackness of the night. Then allowing yourself to wonder, to feel the unknown, to embrace your existence in this kind of masterpiece almost. And, and then doing this with, with, there's some research showing that doing this uh, with a group of friends or even like an animal, your pet, um, can can really en enhance that. So that that social bond can also be part of it. Um, and then allowing that that sense of wonder to extend to the bonds between you and them. Got a question in the chat. Is this live? This is live. Um, had a technical mishap on the the first uh, go around. So, uh, sorry if anybody was trying to follow a link that I sent out in some posts, uh, not, uh, that one didn't work. So we're, we're on a new one, but, um, actually nearing the end here. And, uh, I want to end with this quote from another scientist, um, kind of seeing this, this theme come together of science and awe. And, um, this one comes from Neil deGrasse Tyson. And he writes that, if you think of feelings you have when you are awed by something, for example, knowing that elements in your body trace to exploded stars, I call that a spiritual reaction, speaking of awe and majesty where words fail you. So I just wanted to, to read that. I think it's a, it's a really eloquent way of expressing that this is sort of what we could call a spiritual reaction. A, this just amazing experience of awe and wonder that uh, humans can't seem to get enough of. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I want to thank all of you for watching. I apologize for anybody who is watching on the original stream and uh, the uh, technical issues. I'm going to try to get those um, as fixed for next time. Uh, Yosef says, yeah, I know this. It's awesome. You're right. It is awesome. It's awe-inspiring. Hope everyone's awestruck. Um, thank you. Thank you all for watching. Uh, I guess if, if anybody has any questions, I can stick around for a couple minutes. Um, but if not, I'll just go ahead and sign off. All right. Well, um, looks like that's it. Thank you all so much. And uh, oh, here we go. Got a question. Wait a minute. Okay. Well, um, yeah, these, this, uh, this whole area of, of science is really interesting, really pretty new. There's a lot more psychological research on it than the neuroscience, but uh, I think that stuff is going to be coming out more and more, um, just getting more better technology for looking at it. Um, yeah. And uh, by the way, if anybody, if you uh, enjoy this episode at all, please give it a like and subscribe to this channel and uh, consider signing up on Patreon. Okay, let's see. I think when we understand a concept, 
I think when we understand a concept of reality that makes sense, this is awe. Yeah, I think that that definitely relates to it. Okay, let's see. Yosef, you asked, uh, what do you think about the Roger Penrose's thoughts on consciousness? Uh, Roger Penrose, the, the physicist, I'm not mistaken, he talks about, um, I actually don't, I, I can't pull it off the top of my head, something about the uh, quantum entanglement of, uh, I guess I don't have many thoughts on it. I, I've, I've heard it before. Um, I don't know. I, I tend to think that anyone's explanation of, of consciousness in terms of, of, uh, physical stuff tends to be somewhat dissatisfying. Uh, but I, I don't want to, you know, just generalize to everything. Cause I, I don't really know his thoughts so much. Um, but I will, I'll think about that and, uh, try to maybe answer that in the comments or next time. Thank you for, for asking the question. Um, I will uh, go ahead and end this stream. Thank you so much to everybody who's been watching and who persisted through the technical difficulties. Uh, I will catch you next time.